Good evening, everybody. My name is Joe Hancock. I am the program director for the MS in Retail and Merchandising. And I'm happy to um, sort of introduce you guys um, to somebody that I call part of my um, um, extended family in the retail and merchandising arena. We have known each other for almost 20 years, and I don't think either one of us can believe that. Um, Miss Ann Cecil, who has worked in industry for over 30 years, um, she's held very, uh, various administrative um, and teaching positions in merchandising at several institutions, including Drexel University. This is how long I've known Anne. She was on my hiring committee and she hired me. Um, and she also teaches at the Community College of Philadelphia. Anne has worked in visual merchandising and she has worked in store management. She's worked in corporate. Um, she really specializes though in visual merchandising and store design. She, she shares strategies and tactics with various individuals and she actually does, a, does consulting with small businesses and she speaks at large conferences um, across the country. Um, and she really educates um, individuals on how to merchandise their stores correctly. She is the principal owner of Ono LLC, which I have to ask her about at some point because I keep forgetting, and the founder of the VM Club which is a visual merchandising club that educates individuals and is a subscription service on visual merchandising. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, Anne Cecil. Thank you very much, Joe. And um, I'll give you a little quickie about the ONO. So the total name of my business is ONO Made in the 191. 191 is the starting of a zip code for Philadelphia. And so when I started my, my business, I was helping people who had businesses in the 191, but then it expanded. So the thing about the 191 and Ono is I'm from the 191 and Ono is the O from one, the N from nine and the O from one. So there you go. So there's a little brand story. It's uh, actually instructive. If you guys are interested in understanding um, brand and brand strategy, take a look at my Ono website. And um, if you go to the about page, I tell you my whole story about what it is. And you guys will probably find it pretty interesting in terms of a brand story. The second thing I wanted to just tell you all is that Joe is correct. I predominantly work with independent retailers. I work with independent retailers, makers, small batch makers, so artisans, and even some small manufacturers. But predominantly, I work with independent retailers. And I'm a real champion of the independent. And when I say independent, I really mean micro business in terms of my clients are generally either mom and pops with one store location, or they may have up to five store locations, but they are an owner operator that has one to five retail stores. So there's a real um, sort of disadvantage for independents that are mom and pops in that what has really happened with an independent retailer is they probably have their business for one of two reasons. One is they're super passionate about something. They love it to death. They love it to death. They love it to death. And they jump in and have a store about it because they want to share that passion with others. They don't know the first thing about business, having a store, <laughs> visual merchandising, buying, assortment planning, or any of that, right? And the problem is that if you really need to get that information, there are a lot of ways you can get the business aspect, but there's very few ways you can get the store design and visual merchandising aspect because most of that information is only taught in about seven institutions in this country at and you have to be in a four-year degree program to get that information. It's not really something that's taught in a lot of places um, as like an adult education course. 
So that's one reason that I do what I do. And the other thing I wanted to tell you is that my real perspective about retail, because this is hugely important about what we're going to talk tonight, and it's what's under on this slide, is that I believe that the most important place in the whole retail construct is the selling floor. The sales floor or the sales space. So this could be your your website, it could be online shopping, it could be a pop-up shop you have, but it's in the sales space and in a brick and mortar, that's the selling floor. And the reason that I find this so very important is because the store owner has invested their money in product, which they have presented to their customer physically in their retail store. And the customer is choosing to purchase what has been bought and give their hard-earned cash to the owner of the store. So if that space is underperforming, the business is totally underperforming. And so in my world, you actually would start everything at the store in the process of the back end of retail. And so in my world, if you're a buyer, you buy from the floor back, not from the trend forward. Okay. So I just want you all to understand that's sort of where I come from. All right. So having said that, there's been a lot, a lot, a lot of talk about how retail is dead. Now I have to tell you right now, retail's never going to die. It will never, ever, 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 ever die. And here's why. First of all, as human beings, we've been buying and selling from each other for centuries, centuries. So it is baked into our DNA. Humans like human to human interaction. Well, all of us, except for maybe the millennial cohort, which was the first digitally native cohort. So they maybe don't like person to person so much, but I'll tell you that every other cohort likes person to person stuff. And if you're a millennial, please do not be insulted. I am, that was meant strictly as a joke, but also that research does show that as cohorts go, millennials are the ones who actually prefer digital as one of their first ways of communicating, while all the other shopping cohorts right now, which would be boomers, um, Gen X, and Zs, like human interaction. So please don't feel like I'm slighting you in any way. Um, but I also have to tell you that Retail and brick and mortar retail in particular is the last bastion of free entertainment. You can go people watch, you can discover stuff, you can kill time, you can have a conversation without having to put one thin dime out on any kind of cash register to purchase anything. You can't do that anywhere else. Everywhere else you go, I mean, I suppose, but you know, you have to pay to get into a movie. You have to pay to get into a an amusement park. So there's some kind of fee for entry. The only other place I can think where you could do this is probably at your free library that you could have this same kind of experience, okay? So I think it's really important to understand that those things aren't gonna go away. The biggest shift in retail though is the addition of these multiple channels, which we have been seeing coming on for the last 15, 20 years. And what is even more important now is that we can instantaneously access things through our smartphone that pretty much we can be anywhere in the world and we can get anything that we want. And this is the sea change that is really ushering in the next great age for retail. And so this tonight, what we're going to look at is whether or not and how an independent retailer can be ready for this. Okay, so this is some of the breaking news that I'm going to give you. Um, this would be about six months old now, this retail benchmark survey that I am quoting here. And there is a resource at the end of my talk, so you can see that. And what it revealed was that U.S. consumers really like an in-store experience, but 83% of them say that retailers need to do better on these following items. So keep in mind that people shop to fulfill needs in their life, both material and emotional. 
And every retail excursion follows the same basic journey, discovery, conversion, transaction, fulfillment. So retail has been multi-channel for a long time. I know that people think that the internet was the first multi-channel experience, but I'm going to tell you, we've had catalogs since 1890 something. That is a multi-channel. We, we were able to order things through the mail, through fax machines. So, you know, these things have been going on for a while. Um, there were home parties, there were party sales, you know, so there were a lot of multi-channels even before we got to the internet, but now it's the instantaneous part of it that I think is really different. Now, customers really are looking for four things. So autonomy, and with autonomy, what they're really looking for is self-service. Convenience, which is self-service plus quick checkout, okay? Education, which is where you get information to make your best choice. And engagement, which is where we want an immersive, memorable experience, not just with product, but also would with people. So as the pandemic came through, some of our shopping behaviors changed and it accelerated what people really wanted. Okay, so if we look at this, I think the things that you have to think about are why we shop is the mode that we're shopping, how we shop is the journey, and where we shop is the channel. So with that being said, let's move on and talk about the store. Okay, so one of the things that I really love and um, I will share with you all is I work with and do a lot of store analysis for independent retailers. And the first thing that I'll do is say, is your business customer focused? And everybody to a fault, I've never had anybody told me no. Um, but then I see the front of their store and I'm like, this store is not customer focused at all. It has nothing to do with being customer focused. Now, this especially happened during the pandemic because the stores were shut down. And so they flipped from customer mode to operational mode, and some of them have not come back from operational mode to customer mode. Um, but likely a 2019 and pre-2019 store look pretty much the same since the early days of store. There was a front of house that showed the glamour to the customer and gave the experience and there was a back of house that was less glamorous. And that's where the operations happened. So I worked, one of my first places that I worked after I graduated Drexel, by the way, <laughs> was for John Wanamakers. And I worked in the Center City store, which is now Macy's and some other things. And I want you to know there were tunnels behind the sales walls where all the merchandise went through. We never brought stuff out onto the floor. It all trans nine floors in a huge department store, all the rolling racks, boxes, and everything was going on through tunnels that were hidden from the customer. So that was a really fun space. But essentially, we had a front of house that had customer focus, product presentation and display, amenities and customer services. And we had a back of house that was operations focused. There was some shipping, receiving, and processing. Backstock was back there, employee space, staff ref, restrooms, and offices. What you see in this image, just so you know, is that the red is the back of house, the green is the product display space, and the yellow is the cash wrap. Okay. So pretty much stores looked like this. And um, I think that people, many people who had stores like this, expected that they would return to this. But sort of post-pandemic and during the pandemic and even now, all of a sudden, the store had to become a fulfillment center, a broadcasting company, multi-channel shopping, seamless in-store and online experience, and more. So now, 
we need a customer focus in the front of house. We need the product presentation and their display. We need immersive experiences. We need amenities. But we also need to pick and pack and have a place for in-store pickup. We now need broadcasting or instructional space that we're going to broadcast from. We may need extended store hours and we need a series of customer services. And in our back of house, what we really need is the operations focus where we're going to have receiving, processing, and shipping, employee space and offices, that broadcasting space, and the staff restroom. However, I just want to tell you a quick story. It's not always going to be that your back of house is going to be your broadcasting space. So one of the uh, categories of stores I've worked with quite often is a sewing machine and vacuum company, okay? And a lot of what they're doing is they're teaching people how to use the sewing machines they buy. So the instructional space may actually need to be in the front of house because it may actually be that. And if you had that in the front of house, then you could add the broadcasting to there. And that was one way to go. So the big question for independent, independent retailers has been, what do we need to keep that we learned about from the pandemic? What do we need to change? How do we need to adapt? And what should we do? And one of the things that I think is really important here is everybody needs a micro fulfillment center now. And that is one of the keys to where we're going to go in just a second. All right. <clears throat> so a couple slides ago, we talked about the why is the mode that we're shopping in. The how we're shopping is the journey we're taking. That could be physical, digital, or combination of the two. And the where, the channel. And this too could be digital, brick and mortar. It could be social media, right? It could be a number of different ways. So just keep this in mind as we talk about sort of the shopping modes that we've got. Okay, so let's look at the shopper again. Shoppers generally shift between four motivations to shop. So you have need and want, which is execution and impulse. So when we're looking at these modes, we are looking at wanting kind of autonomy and convenience. And these two modes are transactional. So they're really just about the transaction. It's like, I'm going in, I forgot deodorant. I'm going in to get deodorant. I'm standing in line at the register. I see potato chips. I want potato chips impulse I buy. Okay. There's not a lot of thinking that's going on in that, in these two modes. And they are not a lot of, time investment when you're in these modes. Now, the other two motivations are exploratory and social where engagement and education are the key. So we're looking for discovery, we're looking for a shared experience, and we're in the experiential area here. They require a higher investment of time. And also you'll see that when we're in execution and seek and discover or explore, we're in a functional mode. And if we're in want or connection, we're in our emotional area of mode. Okay, so here's the thing. A lot of times the shopper is a fickle being and motivations can shift multiple times during one shopping excursion, or maybe they don't, right? So. What this slide is really talking to you about is you need to address <laughs> everything here that's on this slide. Need, want, seek, connect, autonomy, convenience, engagement, education, transactional versus experiential, functional, and emotional. That's a lot to get into a store. And it's a lot to try to figure out how do I balance all of those things in one sales space. Now, also, I want you to keep in mind with many, many independent retailers, a lot of times they are also in buildings that are old, not new builds. So many of them are not in big white boxes. They're in old spaces that have super challenging HVAC, electric, walls can't be moved. 
There's all sorts of stuff. They might have plaster and lath, not, you know, um, wallboard. So there's a lot of things that the independent retailer is often looking at that perhaps larger, newer stores are not having to face as well. What everybody needs now is flexible fulfillment. And this is what I'm saying. I don't care who you are. This is something that's really important. So we need quick collect because we still need our instant gratification. However, if we have quick collect, which is an in-store pickup, it requires space for picking up packages and it adds on another service that's often done at the cash rack. Okay, curbside services. So my favorite pre-pandemic curbside invention was at the airport when you could drop your suitcase outside. Heaven, heaven, you didn't have to drag it anywhere. That was of course when travel was a different animal as well. I'm nostalgic for the old travel, but I digress. It was a great idea and it was a great thing for the, the retail store to try and think about. So now what we need to have is we need to maximize our curbside services. So pick up, yes, but how about returns? Maybe you need extended hours before and after open, not your whole store, just your curbside. Amazon's been doing lockers for a while, UPS, all of these places. You can really easily set up locker 24 seven service outside of an independent retail store. It's really not that hard, nor is the investment that great. And you can also think about getting people to use your curbside service by giving exclusive office um, offers to curbside only. CVS was doing this, my CVS was doing this during the pandemic. Um, these are ways to think about how you can get that flexible fulfillment coming. And it's also about how you can accommodate more customers in various ways. Because when we get to the end, you're going to see how difficult it is going to be. You also need to have a micro fulfillment center where you can efficiently pick, pack, and ship. So one of the things I will also tell you about me is that I'm a systems thinker. And not everybody is a systems thinker, and there's nothing wrong with that. But a systems thinker is the person who like walks into a space and something's going wrong. And the first thing they're like is, wow. If we reordered this process, it would go so much more smoothly, right? So that's just how I think. And so it makes me sort of, anytime one of these challenges happen to me, I'm like, oh, wow, if we just switch this around or if we could move this space to here or get this out of this space and into there, we can make this happen. So this is the store of the future. Now, I want you to understand the first store that I showed you is the black dotted line here. So you see that we are extending services outside of our store. Here's the thing, unless you own your building, you can't make it bigger. So if you're renting from somebody, your space is your space, but you may have real estate outside of your building that you can expand into. So that's one of the first things that we need to think. You need to consider the total space you have inside and outside and what can happen and extend to the outside that can add to value for your customer a good customer experience and cash in your cash register, okay? So I'm a big proponent of this as well. Your cash wrap should be your cash wrap. It should not be a place where other things are happening. If you think about larger retailers, not necessarily small independents, you will, you will know that most of the checkout, the thing that happens at checkout is when we're ringing you up and getting you out the door. If you have a return, you go to customer service. If you need to pick something up, you go to customer service. If you need help with a bill, you go to customer service. A lot of times in a small retail store, all of those things happen at the cash wrap. And you know what it does? It makes the cash wrap experience horrific once there's a line. Okay. So in this store of the future, 
here's what we need to think about. We have to think about how in-store shopping models can be translated into new systems and processes for a much more sophisticated and tech savvy shopper. We need to utilize the entire space that we have to us. That's inside and out. We need to provide customer journeys for multiple shopping modes. We need to create innovative, immersive customer experiences, integrate multiple channels, and add flexibility and convenience for the customer to shopping and fulfillment functions. So let's just take a look. Yellow is now curbside. I'm pretending that this store is really lucky and it's got a side area as well, okay? But all of a sudden now with curbside, you can do a whole lot more. I spoke with some people about this at a recent conference and it was really great because um, one of the other things, one of the things that I hadn't added to curbside, because I told you on the last slide that like we could do all of these things there. You could you could do pickup, you could do returns, you know, you could do a number of things. So I had a great argument going on amongst the retailers. One person said, I don't want to do returns curbside because a return is an opportunity to sell something else. That's true. But your customer has to want to be in have the time and be in the mode or the mood to shop if you're going to try to sell them another product. And a lot of times, if you're just driving by for pickup, you might like to drive by to just drop off your return. So you're not necessarily wanting to go into the store and have a long involved conversation with somebody about buying something else. And so that was an argument that we had between people. There were the two factions and it was quite interesting. The second thing that was kind of interesting was another store owner said, I have a number of people in my constituency, my customer base who are unable to um, shop. They're limited in mobility. So she said, what I do is, you know, they drive up and they give me their shopping list and I go in and I personal shop for them and bring it out curbside and show it to them in the car. Well, great. Now, all of a sudden, you can have a personal shopping service at your curbside if you've got the right way to do it. And you can put a system in that will allow you to do so. So that was a very creative way of thinking outside the box, particularly for people who perhaps are worried about being inside during the pandemic because they were in a high risk group or those who have trouble moving. Um, and mobil mobilizing around a retail store, especially if you have to keep a great deal of distance between people. I thought it was a very creative and innovative way to think about curbside. Um, micro fulfillment. So one of the things that I think is really important about micro fulfillment that makes the whole system most efficient, and this is where I'm not talking about pickup. I'm talking about picking, packing, and shipping. Those um, functions plus the receiving function ideally are going to be at the super back of your house because what we ideally want are delivery trucks not in your curbside area and not having delivery drivers delivering or taking out massive amounts of packages through your sales floor. So ideally, this is at the back. And you see that I have given the red area is this area. And it also has um, the exterior. So there can be drive up for big pickup. Maybe your lockers can go out here if you have a camera, right? Um, and you can put your staff room and your broadcast room back in this area as well. Okay. The green area is still your product presentation and display area. It's always going to be your product display area because it's going to be where you've got the customer coming in the store and you want them to be excited when they walk in the room. Okay. The cash wrap here I'm showing is that gold slice. And this may be a cash wrap plus an information center. So maybe there's a section of this that is register, and there's a section of this that is for other services, okay? 
I personally would also think about your cash wrap in the store of the future and see if it's not something where there is a desk for things that are not cashing out, but that your registers are mobile. The Apple store does it really well, but there's also no reason that if you have wireless in your store, you can't have a few podiums on wheels that have shopping bags and things like that, that you can't station in your store in various areas to let them be flexible and to work depending on the crowd in your store that day. Okay. Social connection. People want social connection, right? So the purple area is a space where you may have your social connection. So this could be something where maybe it depends on the type of store you are, but maybe there is a lecture in the store. Maybe there is a, an author, if it's a bookstore and this is where their talk would be. Maybe you sell something um, like sewing machines that need, you might need people to come in and need help with. So maybe this is the space where people come in and learn how to use their sewing machines. So it is kind of a social connection. It could be a community thing that you do for people. Lululemon having um, yoga classes in their stores when the store is closed as a way to have this kind of social connection space. So that's an example of how people have been doing it. And then one of my favorite things is thinking about how you could showroom products in your store. So this is the Ikea mode of we show it here and it's in this aisle and you pick it and get it. These are some ways to think about it. Now, going back to our shoppers, you know, if your shopper wants self-service, showrooming can be a great thing. If your customer wants convenience, showrooming with an option to self-checkout is a great thing. So we have a lot of these things that you want to start to think about and pull on and combine together and consider how you can move that into a basic independent retail space. So let's just look at this sort of space and think about it. <clears throat> and what I want you to most understand is that in the future store, what we are losing is space for physical product to be housed on the sales floor. That is the bottom line. So what it really means is this. We need to create a blended space in our store that's flexible and allows for quick changes that accommodate and add value to whatever your customer wants while bringing you the sales and profit you need. This means you've got to make every linear foot of your sales space efficient and producing. You're going to have less space to present product and you're going to have less space to display product. So you have to make the same or more sales and profit in less overall space. So it is now more than ever really important to connect the buy to the sales floor, to the cash register, and to understand how to do that. And I think that's really something that we're going to have to focus on getting really good at with our businesses. And it's going to be something where you're really going to need to combine data, deep understanding of your business yourself, and really understanding all of the functions of the business. The first thing that you always have to do is clean up your assortment. If it's not selling, you got to get it out. No other thing you can do. If you are looking for new items, you need to get higher margin items to replace what you let go. So your assortment needs to be considered in that way as well. You want to think about if you're using every available foot of space. So ceilings, floors, windows. If you have a restroom, a public restroom, is there space in your restroom that you can sell something? How about in your fitting room? These are all places that you want to be looking for that you're not necessarily thinking of as display areas now, but that you need to think of, okay? Are the fixtures the most efficient for your space? You know, 
here's a, just a little thing that I can tell you that's really, really simple. If you talk about the way that you fold, right? You can fold something so that it's horizontally folded or vertically folded. One direction will allow you to put a dozen on a shelf. If you fold the opposite way, you can only fit six on a shelf. That makes a difference. Okay, so you really have to understand your fixturing and what it means to put product on those fixtures. Now, this says to sign up for an intro to a master merchant advisory, and I'm just going to tell you what that is. You guys don't want to do that, but some of you who maybe have worked with me understand what I'm talking about. Um, in a master merchant situation, what you really need to do is you need to be able to understand data down to the linear foot so that you can understand how your product is performing on specific spaces on specific fixtures. And you need to find where you're selling, where you're not. You need to figure out if it's the product that's selling or the space that is selling it. You need to find and identify these zones. And the way to do that is to understand your product through your data, but also to use your experience and knowledge of your store, your category, and your business to pull it all together so that you can be prepared for the store of the future. And this is where the resources for the review are. And I'm happy to take questions, comments, discussion. Now. <laughs> Any questions for Anne? Or comments. Or comments. Like, what do you think? Hi, Ann. This is Kim. I thought that was fant a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I used to um, work in Macy's Harold Square. And when you were talking about the tunnels, it reminded me that's how it is also with the buying office, how everything was like behind the scenes. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. I I never, th Ann, I never thought that you would be discussing the the floor plan and how impactful the floor plan of a retail space can be and how you can redistribute to accommodate for the future and the t and all the issues that we've had moving forward like i never even thought of it as a floor space redesign never i just well i'm glad <laughs> I'm, no i'm that person that's stuck in the box that the floor <laughs> stays the same and you do everything else outside the space the, the notion that you're talking about redefining the space and resituating everything within that space is very interesting. Like it, it was like an eye-opening experience for me. I've never thought of it in that, in that way. So I thought that that was interesting and still maintain the experiential process of the retail space. So I really like that you're saying that Joe, because I think that one of the things that's really true is that, um, and from many, many years in retail and, Everybody in the audience, in in the audience, if you have retail experience, no matter whether it's probably a little or a lot, one of the things that I think has always been sort of the bane of the retail existence is that for many many years, people just have this idea that if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nobody wants to move. Listen, a a massive store redo is hard. <laughs> It's yeah. hard work and it takes planning and it time. Is. I've it takes done it. Yeah. planning. It's awful. It's awful. But at the end of the day, you can't, uh, I mean, you know, we can't say it's just too much work because the benefit is so much different. So one of my most recent um, retailers that I've been working with, I've been working with two that I'll just share stories with you guys. One was a, um, sewing machine store, but also a fabric store, primarily uh, known for quilts. And they were in a very old building. Um, it had like a room at the front, a larger middle room, and then a room at the back. And along the side, it had sort of operational spaces. So, you know, they walked me through the whole thing. And 
they had their machines in this front room, but the front room was kind of small for the machines. And they had fabric and stuff in the way back. And so at the end of the conversation with them, we flip the front room as the fabric room, right? Because you walk in and you're excited. There's color. <laughs> There's not just 16 white machines that all look the same. You walk into a space that's color and experience. And like you start touching fabric and notions and things that like, you know, you get excited about your next project. And then you go into where you can build on that. And then the machines are at the back. Because people don't come in to buy a machine every day, but they come in to buy fabric every day. Well, the thing that was great about it is, and they were terrific. They were a terrific team of people. They were open-minded. They faced the situation with absolute um, positivity and they changed the whole thing. And it was a huge, I mean, it was a huge endeavor for them. But what I have to tell you is it was, um, they said, and to their customers as well, they felt like they had walked into a new, dynamic, modern store with that, that they now were really like the experts in quilting in a hundred mile radius. And that whole, so not the change while it was hard and long, it also though resulted in not just a facelift for the store, but a whole change in attitude for the staff. And that also created a whole different thing for the customers, right? So that was really cool. The other thing, the other one that I'll just tell you about, because this is really drives home, maybe the space planning activity to all of you. I have a client who is a uh, tea, tea is her thing. So she has a store that has a front space that has all tea products and tea related products. She then had a bar where you could get tea to go. And then there was a small space behind that. The bar was situated in the middle of this space, not at the back or the front, because that's where the water was. So again, Sometimes we are limited by structure, you know. She got an opportunity after the pandemic to get the adjacent space and decided she was going to make it into a tea cafe. But smartly, she was not going to allow people to enter the cafe without having walked through her retail store. Brilliant. Fantastic. Right? Because they have to enter and leave going through product. Yes. All right. But here's the thing, where they were breaking through the space was right where that tea bar was and still is. And the this is another thing that's very interesting and I'd just like to point out to everybody in the room. Um, not all architects understand retail. So it is, but I want you to understand again, remember I'm working with an independent retailer. So how is that independent retailer finding an architect? They go to Google and say architect near me. So they may be working with an architect who has no idea about retail. So my first, the first thing I said to her was that the, the bar's got to move to the back of the front room. I, it has to, because now the highest traffic area is in this central space. So there's already a back space that people didn't go past the bar to shop. And now if you have people going in and out of the other room and in and out to get tea, Nobody's shopping near that. Nobody's shopping near that. So it's taken longer. The project itself is still in process. But in the end, the tea bar is going to go into the back room. And so now what will happen is you'll exit the cafe and there will be product that is what you experienced in the cafe that you can buy to take home and do stuff with eventually. But it's interesting because, um, you know, I drew this out in terms of something very quickly in a quick sketch and showed it to her, the store owner. And she was like, oh, yeah, oh, who would want to shop there? But her architect said it wouldn't matter. 
And, you know, so again, thinking about the fact that space is so important and how people move through that space is really important. And whether people will stay to shop has to do with how comfortable they are. And again, this is why I say when I ask people, is your business customer focused? And people say, yes. I'm like, no, because putting a bar in the middle of your store is not customer focused. So I'm glad you brought it up, Joe, because that space is precious. You know, you have maybe 1,200 feet of space. Yeah. That's it. And if you don't allocate it properly, it can really be a problem. Yeah, I agree 100%. Any more? Thank you, Anne. Any more questions? Anne, this was much appreciated. And are people, can I, so your two links are on the um, website. If someone wants to reach out to you, how should they reach out? Just through the the links and the website? Yes, the links is, is the easiest way to get me. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank and you. it was lovely to see you. And I will see you soon, I'm sure. Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for coming.